Mother Teresa once said, The most terrible poverty is loneliness, the feeling of being unloved. And while we in the first world think we're the richest in history, with our cars, our flat screen TVs, and two extra living rooms, in many ways, we are also the loneliest. We've isolated ourselves in our individual boxes, hopping into boxes, to sit in boxes. He's talking about cubicles. Only to come home to empty boxes until we end up in a box forever. The most terrible poverty is loneliness. And as mental health issues rise, we are now only beginning to realize how poor we really are. In the past, multiple generations would live and eat together. We would know our neighbors, ask people out on dates in person, and call friends for rides to the airport. But with the advent of technology and materialism, we've gradually optimized away these inconvenient social interactions. We're too polite to depend on friends, so we call an Uber instead. We swipe to find love, and dinner with friends now has a completely different meaning. And though, make no mistake, all this technology and progress that got us here has been so valuable to society. But at the same time, we're losing the connection we so desperately need as human beings. According to Vivek Murthy, the former Surgeon General of the United States, we live in the most technologically connected age in the history of civilization, yet rates of loneliness have doubled since the 1980s. Loneliness is a growing health epidemic. Speaking of health epidemic, studies show that loneliness is as deadly as smoking an entire pack of cigarettes a day, making it more deadly than obesity, taking seven years off of your overall life expectancy. That's 15 cigarettes a day, every single day. On a biological level, isolation bathes your body in a constant barrage of stress hormones, which accelerates the aging process and cripples your immune system. In fact, so much so that lonely people actually suffer more from a whole range of diseases, from the common cold to major complications like heart disease, stroke, and type 2 diabetes. A 2010 study even found that people with fewer social connections were 50% more likely to die over a given period of time than those with strong social bonds. I think this second quote by Dr. Murthy sums it up best. During my years caring for patients, the most common pathology I saw was not heart disease or diabetes. It was loneliness. And so the question I have about all of this is if loneliness is such a big threat to our health and our well-being, why are we having such a difficult time doing something about it? I mean, conventional wisdom says it shouldn't be that hard to stop being lonely. All you've got to do is just go say hi to people and everything will be fine. But for some reason, that's not actually what's happening because the world is seeing so many of these negative consequences of people feeling relationally broken and not being able to connect. I want to figure out what is actually stopping us from connecting so we can start to heal this world and all the pain that we see from all of this disconnection going on. And so, I went straight to the experts. At Stanford, getting ready to go film in the neuroscience lab, super excited. This week I got to go visit some new friends and researchers in the social neuroscience lab at Stanford University where they're studying the impact of loneliness on the brain. I'm Andrea Courtney, I'm a postdoc at Stanford in the Stanford Social Neuroscience Lab. Andrea and her team are working on various research studies to understand loneliness at a neurological level. So one interesting thing about loneliness is that it's actually not the number of friends you have, but how close you feel to the friends you have and whether you're receiving the social support that you need. So it might be that you have a lot of people around who are willing to support you, but you don't feel that support. So that's one reason we wanted to turn to brain imaging. And we were specifically interested in looking at activation in a series of brain regions that we call the social brain. So what we find is that these regions of the brain care a lot about how close other people are to us and where they fall within our social circle. Um, and one interesting aspect of that is that some of this gets skewed by loneliness. So if you report feeling lonelier, you actually show more disparate activation in the social brain, so that there's this increased um, perception of social distance between the self and other people. And so this is fascinating. What Andrea was saying is that loneliness causes us to perceive people as being more socially distant from us than we normally would. And actually hearing her say all this really made a lot of sense. It put into words what I had been experiencing 
pretty much my entire life. In the loneliest times, I felt like I'd fallen into this deep dirt pit all by myself, like everyone was so far away they could no longer even see me down here. Connection seems a lot more scary and intimidating when we're lonely. I remember times when I would doubt that even my closest friends would want to hang out with me. And when we did hang out, I would interpret even the slightest things as being signals that we were more distant than before. And all of that, ironically, made it even scarier to leave the house and see people to reconnect, thinking of all the possible ways it might hurt to be rejected. As it turns out, um, experiencing social pain from something like social rejection actually elicits activation in similar areas to physical pain. Social pain activates the actual physical pain receptors in your brain, to the point where a study even found that giving lonely people Tylenol actually affected how lonely they felt. But of course, like physical pain, while it can be tempting to numb it with painkillers, it's not the healthiest way to go about it. Rather, pain is an important signal our brains give us to go help us figure out what is wrong so we can go heal the underlying issue. The pain of loneliness pushes us to reestablish that human connection we need as human beings. But hold on a second. If loneliness is our brain's signal that we need connection, why does it then go turn around and make it scarier for us to go get that connection? The late John Cassiopo, another prominent researcher on loneliness at the University of Chicago, poses an interesting explanation for why this happens. And so this, there's a fear associated with isolation. Um, and knowing that there's a fear and threat and much of our reaction to other people is premised on that fear and threat is important for getting out of this. Loneliness makes connecting scarier for us because it causes us to become more sensitive to social stimuli. When starving, we become more sensitive to bitter than sweet tastes because that was more associated with poisons. And it's the same with loneliness. When we are the most socially vulnerable, our brains are on higher alert knowing that connecting with the wrong people or trusting someone prematurely may result in more severe consequences because we don't have the safety of an existing social support system. And so our brains magnify any perceived social danger in efforts to keep us safe. And now hearing all this was very eye-opening for me. I used to feel some degree of shame in noticing that I was lonely. There's a certain stigma around it. We assume that loneliness is a sign that we are unwanted or that there's something wrong with us. But as the research shows, it's just our brains trying to tell us that we have an unmet need for connection so that we can go seek it out. So I actually wanted to try something with you right now, if that's okay. Wherever you are, just take a second to check in with yourself and see if you notice any feelings of loneliness. Because of the shame associated with it, we often numb ourselves with distractions as a way to deny it. When you were scrolling YouTube just now, scrolling from video to video, what were you really looking for? If you're like me, most of the time that answer is, I'm looking for connection to feel less alone. And if you can relate, it's hard to acknowledge that we may indeed be lonely people. But the good news from the research is that there's nothing wrong with you if you feel lonely. It just means that you're human. That's how our brains work to survive. So the first step to healing is really being aware of the problem and acknowledging loneliness for what it is. A signal from your brain guiding us towards what we need. It's a real neurological and sociological phenomenon that helps us move towards filling the social needs we have as a species. Having social relationships actually helps to buffer you from stress. What's really important is both having people to turn to, so having access to those people, and also disclosing your stress to those people. One interesting piece of that, though, is that we find that lonely people, who might actually be the people who need that social support most, are less likely to reach out to people when they're feeling down. So the best way to kind of heal loneliness is really to reach out for social connection. Hey, what's up? <laughs> and maybe even to provide that social connection to other people or that social support for other people. Being able to feel safe with other people is probably the single most important aspect of mental health. The story doesn't end there, my friends. This is the second video on our journey to build this movement of connectionism, a realization that we need connection in our world more than ever as a basic human need we all have. Coming up, we've got some more exciting stuff I can't wait to share. So make sure to subscribe, hit the bell, and sign up for the email list at connectionism.org for some extra goodies in the near future.
And with that, I hope you are well today. Sending you a big hug if you need it. Much love, my friends. See you in the next one.